interdependence, adaptations to life on land. Your Florida benchmark, compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and plants and enable them to survive in different environments, such as life cycle variations, animal behaviors, and physical characteristics. And here is your scale. Remember your goal is to be a level three or higher. Your learning goal. The students will be able to compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and plants that enable them to survive in different environments. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start looking at a few different biomes and some of the plant and animal adaptations for each of those. Starting with forests. Forests are habitats filled with trees. Temperate forests have warm summers and cold winters. Plants and animals have adaptations that help them live in the forest. Here's a picture of a typical temperate forest. You can see that the leaves are changing color. So this is fall or autumn. Here's another photo. You can see that most forests are shady. So plants that live there have to be able to adapt to less light. Birds and insects are common in the forest. Plants and animals have many adaptations that allow them to survive in the temperate forests. The temperate forest has deciduous trees, shrubs, and bushes. It is also shady. Deciduous simply means that it is a plant whose leaves will fall off. Deciduous trees have leaves that change color. Deciduous trees lose, lose their leaves before winter to help prevent water loss in the cold, dry air. Actually, before a tree drops its leaves, it will actually pull all the nutrients from those leaves deeper inside the tree to, to use them before the leaves are released. New leaves will sprout from the trees in the spring. A tree's leaves convert sun, air, water, and minerals into more trees. A lot of rainforest tree leaves have a similar shape. What does a smooth, pointed leaf shape do for trees that grow where it rains just about every day? Where leaves can stay on a tree for a whole year, why do you think so many of them are thick, leathery, or waxy? Temperate forest tree leaves take a lot of different shapes, and each shape, from oak leaf to pine needle, has its advantages. For example, sometimes a single tree has differently shaped leaves. Oak leaves in the sun can get too hot. They cool themselves most near their edges, and leaves with weak curves have more edge. In the shade, cooling isn't so important, but leaves need to make the most for light. There, leaves have shallower curves to catch more light. Some low trees that live in hot sand even turn their leaves sideways to avoid the heat. The special ways that living things fit into their habitat are called adaptations. When storms blow trees over, or a forest fire burns them, light reaches ground that the trees once shaded. The clearings make way for new plants and animals, so the forest can renew itself. It's the same in a rainforest. Trees overloaded with plants fall and clear a patch where light can reach the ground. In those patches, the forest renews itself. But large clearings for farms, highways, or timbering don't renew the forest. They change it in other ways. To understand the changes, we need to understand how trees and other forms of life are connected. And that means getting to know the diversity of life in, on, and under trees. You can explore trees as close as your backyard. Climb one, or just look up.
right, let's move on to tropical rainforests. Tropical rainforests are warm and rainy all year. This is because they are located along the equator. A tropical rainforest is also called a jungle. Several layers of plants grow from the forest floor. The soil is very thin in tropical rainforests because of the large amounts of rain. The rain can actually wash away much of the soil. So the plants that live there have to adapt. Some trees have roots that grow down from branches to prop them up. Those are called prop roots. And others have roots that make walls that spread around the tree. This is a picture of a tropical rainforest. You can see how dense it is, um, or a jungle. Lots and lots of vegetation. Jaguars, monkeys, and sloths live in and around the trees. Many animals are brightly colored to warn predators that they are poisonous. Some animals are brightly colored to help them find their family in the dim light of the forest environment. So you can see in the top left, we have the sloth. On the bottom left, we have the jaguar. Top right, we have the orangutan. And we have the toucan at the bottom right. Here are some brightly colored frogs, Amazon tree frogs. You can see how they are extremely bright and colorful. just make the rainforest drip, it makes it tick. So many different kinds of creatures live in rainforests. Because plenty of sunlight falls there, there's plenty of room. It stays warm all year. And it's really wet. and branches, wet moss, wet leaves, each one a place a plant can grow. And usually, if a plant can grow, so can something else.
creatures live through it. How would you guess they do it? Plants in drier places might have special roots to gather more water, leaves that hold water in, or leaves that turn to avoid the sun. Animals might save water by not sweating. Instead, they just let their body temperature rise when it gets hot. Even though living things can adapt to dryness, there usually aren't as many different kinds of living things in dry places as in wet ones, all other things being equal. In wet places, all the wet nooks and crannies make a lot of small habitats where different kinds of creatures can eke out a living. The more habitats, the greater the diversity. Different rainforest plants are adapted to the wetness in different ways. Some rainforest plants get enough water by just sticking their roots out into the air. In wet areas, vines can send long, thin roots down from far above without drying out. A lot of rain can wash minerals from the soil, so rainforest plants really hold on to the minerals they take up. A lot of plants have leaves with pointy tips to shed water and get dry quick when the sun comes out. Many rainforest leaves are waxy to keep the minerals inside them from washing out and to keep from wilting when it gets hot. Each acre of tropical rainforest makes about twice the weight of leaves and sticks as a temperate forest. But if you compare the amount of fallen leaves and sticks on the forest floor, Tropical forests have only a fraction as much as temperate forests. Where does all that stuff go in the tropics? The answer is that in a wet and warm place, that stuff decomposes in less than a year, leaving only a thin layer. Where it's drier, things don't decay so quickly. So fallen leaves and needles build up a thick, spongy carpet. We call that fallen stuff litter. All the rain in wet tropical forests makes habitats that don't exist in drier places. For example, some rainforest tree frogs hatch, become tadpoles, turn into frogs, and lay eggs all in little pools that form in plants that live in trees. These frogs live their whole life without leaving the tree. Where it's drier, tree frogs don't have pools in their homes. They have to leave the trees to lay their eggs. The trick is to survive the overland trip to the water. The amount of rain falling 
and how often it falls make a great difference for the living things in a forest. Steady and plentiful wetness is one of the most important reasons so many different kinds of things live in rainforests. The amount of rain is no less important for the plants and animals of temperate forests. The drier and more irregular climate make for other plants and animals and less diversity. But both dry and wet places have diversity and it's precious in both places. Wet or dry, forests are home for a lot of different kinds of creatures, each adapted to its place. Go to a nearby forest and see what you can find out about creatures' adaptations to the amount of rain in your area. All right, let's move on to grasslands and prairies. Grasses are the main plant life in a grassland. Grasslands have less rain than forests, which is why few trees grow in the grasslands. The grasses have narrow leaves and broad root systems. Animals in the grassland include gazelles, cheetahs, lions, meerkats, eagles, and vultures. Grasslands in North America are also known as prairies. Bison, coyotes, rabbits, and prairie dogs are common in the prairie. Here's a picture of a typical prairie or grassland. Notice very few, if any, trees. Here's another. Here's some animals that are common. So we have the cheetah, on the left, we have on the bottom right, we have the meerkats, and in the middle there is the prairie dog. Lions to the left, gazelle on the bottom right. Um, something interesting to note is that typically the female lions are the ones that are doing most of the hunting. Grasses are well suited to the hardships of their environment. They can survive cold winters. They can endure long periods without rain. They grow back after being trampled on and grazed by buffalo, pronghorn, and other animals. One reason grass is so durable lies in its design. Each blade grows straight up rather than to the side. This way, each gets sunlight, but doesn't shade its neighbor. Grass can be clipped or chewed and remain healthy because unlike most plants, grass does not grow from its tips. Instead, grass grows from underground stems called rhizomes, which are not damaged by grazing. Grasses also have extensive root systems that soak up water and store food that helps grass grow back after a long winter or even after a fire. Fires are frequent on the prairie. In fact, they play an important role in the ecology of grasslands. Fires burn off trees, saplings, and shrubs that might compete with grass, but do little damage to a grass's roots and rhizomes, which send out new shoots. Grasses benefit from fire in other ways. The ash that is left after a fire is good fertilizer. Grasses that grow back are often richer and denser than what existed before. Grasses are not the only prairie plants. From spring through autumn, prairies are marked by the bright colors of blooming flowers, such as dotted gay feather, blue sage, tall thistle, sunflowers, and prickly poppy. Such plants are called forbs. Forbs are any grassland plant other than grass that have soft as opposed to woody stems. Like grasses, 
Forbs have deep root systems that help them thrive in conditions where less hardy plants would die. Grasses and forbs, like other plants, get energy from the sun. They use the energy of sunlight, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and water to manufacture their own food. This process is called photosynthesis. In grasslands, as in any biome, there is a flow of energy from plants to animals and from one animal to another. In one way or another, most animals on the prairie depend on grasses and other plants for survival. Some, like pronghorn and buffalo, eat plants. Many insects, such as grasshoppers, also feed on prairie grasses and forbs. Other animals, like this spider, feed on plant eaters, like grasshoppers. This hawk is eating a prairie dog. In this way, energy flows from the sun to plants, from plants to plant eaters, and from plant eaters to meat eaters. This transfer of energy is called a food chain. There are many food chains in a grassland. Together, like threads in a tapestry, they form a web of life. Over thousands of years, the animals of grasslands have developed adaptations or special features that help them fit into their environment. Grass is tough to digest, so grazers like buffalo and pronghorn have special stomachs that contain bacteria and other microorganisms that help them digest grass. Such animals are called ruminants. Ruminants cough up from their stomachs wads of grass called cuds, which they chew a second or even a third time. Other kinds of adaptations help protect animals from predators that might eat them. The scarcity of trees on grasslands makes it harder for larger animals to hide. Some depend on speed for safety. Pronghorn can run at 97 kilometers or 60 miles per hour. Because there are so few trees, most grassland birds nest on the ground. Rather than flying, the sharp-tailed grouse usually struts along the ground. To attract a mate, the male performs an elaborate courtship dance. The burrowing owl lives underground. When it senses danger, it will dive into its burrow. Many kinds of grassland animals live underground. In desert grasslands, rough harvester ants carry seeds and grains back to their nests. These ants cut down so many plants that they create large areas of bare land around the entrances to their colonies. The western garter snake hibernates underground during the winter. In warmer weather, it often basks in the early morning sun. Prairie dogs, which aren't dogs at all but squirrel-like rodents, dig elaborate underground cities with dens, sleeping areas, and places to store food. Sentinels stand guard at entrances that are built up into mounds. Prairie dogs have a great impact on other living things in their environment. Their abandoned burrows are homes to other animals. Around their entrance mounds, prairie dogs eat the grass to within four inches of the soil. The grass that grows back is more nutritious. For this reason, buffalo like to graze near prairie dog communities. Prairie dogs were once considered pests by farmers and ranchers, and millions were killed. Today, prairie dogs are protected, but because of the impact of humans on the prairie, they are no longer the common sight they once were. Alright, moving on to the deserts. A desert is a place that receives very little rain. If you remember when we discussed um, this earlier, we talked about how deserts are dry. And that is the one word you should definitely think of when you are 
describing a desert. Too many people just immediately go to deserts are hot, but remember the more important thing is deserts are dry. Very dry areas that receive very, very little rain. Um, and some deserts, as you know, can be cold. Not all deserts are hot. Antarctica, for example, is a cold desert. So plants and animals must have special adaptations to survive there because it is so dry with very little water. Many plants have a waxy coating to protect them from water loss. Many animals are nocturnal. Remember, this means that they are active at nighttime and they are sleeping in the day. Um, so they come out basically when it's cooler out and this is, this is the hot deserts. They'll come out when it's cooler and sleep during the hottest parts of the day. Camels are common in the North African and Middle Eastern deserts. driest places on earth. All deserts get very little rain, 25 centimeters a year or less. And when rain does fall, it doesn't stay around for long. In deserts, the combination of clear skies, sun, and wind cause whatever moisture there is to evaporate quickly. Deserts also have the most extreme temperature shifts on the planet. Temperatures in the Gobi Desert in Central Asia can soar to 45 degrees Celsius in the summer and drop to a frigid minus 40 degrees Celsius in the winter. Yet hundreds of species of plants and animals live in deserts. They have adaptations that allow them to survive the harsh conditions of this biome. For instance, some desert plants can lie dormant for hundreds of years until rain finally falls and they sprout. And in southern Africa, the meerkats of the Kalahari Desert can live for years without ever taking a drink of water. They have the ability to get moisture in other ways. It's one of the many adaptations meerkats have that allow them not only to survive, but to thrive in a very inhospitable environment. Climatic conditions are common to all deserts. As you watch the following segment, think about the adaptations and behaviors that help meerkats survive in a desert. The Kalahari Desert stretches across 500,000 square kilometers of southern Africa. It's early summer in the Kalahari, the longest season of the year, a full seven months. The land is dry, but not as dry as it will be by midsummer, just before the annual rain comes. Now, there is still enough desert grass to feed herds of migrant wildebeest and springbok a gazelle that lives in this biome. In the sky, a martial eagle looks for prey. On the ground, a jackal does the same. And a family of meerkats dig. Meerkats spend much of their lives digging. Some are searching for food, grubs, termites, and other insects that are a basic part of the meerkat diet. Others are digging burrows, a complicated system of tunnels, sleeping chambers, and escape holes. Meerkats use the burrows for shelter from the extreme temperatures and from predators. One look at a meerkat's front claws indicates how well suited these animals are to digging. Long and curved, the claws are like shovels that easily dig through the red-brown sand of the Kalahari. There are many other adaptations you can see in meerkats. For instance, meerkats can close their ears completely to keep out the sand. They 
They also have dark markings around their eyes that function like built-in sunglasses. The markings help to reduce glare. And, perhaps most importantly, meerkats don't need to drink water to survive. They get all the moisture they need from the insects and small mammals they eat. Meerkat's ability to go without water is a huge advantage in the Kalahari. There is no permanent surface water here. The only moisture lies beneath the sand. Like meerkats, many of the plants and animals that live here have adaptations that enable them to conserve water. The roots of the acacia tree tunnel 30 meters underground to capture whatever water there is. Scorpions, which are a food source for meerkats, have a covering or exoskeleton that is thick and hard enough to prevent moisture from escaping from their bodies. Meerkats are not affected by scorpion venom, even though it can sicken and even kill many creatures, including humans. It is now late summer, and the annual rains are overdue. The rainy season in the Kalahari is relatively brief, but it's the time when the majority of the desert precipitation falls, up to 20 centimeters. Today, though, the skies bring not relief, but trouble. The lightning ignites the parched desert branches. The meerkat territory goes up in flames have to relocate to a distant burrow system. With no rain, life gets harder for all desert dwellers. Insects, which need water to breathe, burrow deeper into the sand in search of moisture. That affects the meerkats, which now have to work harder for their food. To find a single insect, they often must dig an amount of sand equal to their own body weight. In the food chains of the Kalahari, the meerkats, too, become prey for hungry carnivores. Their biggest threat on the ground comes from jackals. The cobra is another meerkat predator. One meerkat protects the burrow that forces the cobra to retreat. With no rain and scarce food, the meerkats are exhausted. As usual, they take a break at midday when the sun is fiercest. In the summer, air temperatures in the Kalahari can reach 49 degrees Celsius. The sand is even hotter, reaching temperatures as high as 70 degrees Celsius. Some of the meerkats move into shade. Others go into the burrows to rest. It is now nearly winter. The rains still haven't come. Finding food is harder than ever. The meerkats are losing weight. And it's getting colder. At night, temperatures now dip almost to freezing. In the mornings, the meerkats must warm up before they begin the day's hunt for food. They stand facing the sunrise and their flat, dark-skinned chests act as solar panels and warm their bodies. Finally, the rain arrives in torrents. It falls for 15 hours straight, turning the desert sand to mud and flooding some of the meerkat burrows. The next morning, the desert is shrouded in mist, but the sun and the dry desert air soon clear the sky, and the meerkats arrive to an unusual sight puddles of water. Soon the rains transform the Kalahari. The desert grasses sprout and the springbok feast. But the greening of the desert won't last long. Dry air and the cold winter winds will cause the water to evaporate. The wildebeest will leave in search of new grazing areas. So will the other migrants. The springbok another kind of gazelle, the Gemsbok. Not the meerkat. This is their permanent home.
they will remain through the desert cycles of extreme heat and cold, and through the long dry season. How does the use of burrows help meerkats survive in the desert? All right, moving from the desert, let's go into the taiga. The taiga is a far northern habitat with very cold winters and short, warm summers. Pines, firs, and spruces are evergreen trees in the taiga. They do not lose their leaves. Conifers are evergreen trees that grow seeds inside of cones. Here's a picture of a taiga. It's kind of hard to see, but that dark section on the bottom, those are some evergreen trees. Here's a taiga in the wintertime. You can see it covered with snow. Those trees actually have very um, good adaptations to um, survive and be able to thrive with that much heavy snow on them. They have very thin um, leaves called needles. Um, and they actually allow the snow to fall off um, easily. And they're also very flexible. Here are some conifers, also known as evergreen trees, same kind we usually use for Christmas trees in the middle and the right. All right, so animals. Animals can have very thick fur coats to protect them from the cold if they live in the taiga. Fur color can actually help animals be camouflaged as well. Birds are common in the taiga in the summer, but many migrate south in the winter. All right, getting even colder now, let's move to the polar. Polar habitats are located near the North Pole and the South Pole. In the tundra, snow on the surface can melt in the summer, but the ground underneath stays frozen. Lichens, Reindeer, penguins, and polar bears are common. Okay, so these are lichens on a rock, just so you get an idea of what they are. Here's a polar bear. Remember the polar bear has the layer of blubber to help keep them warm. A group of birds attracts John's attention. Uh, we, uh, what is it? Keep an eye on the polar bear and let's have a look at what you just ate. There's a lot of red. It's a ring seal. Not very big, huh? It's a mother polar bear. Her muzzle, still red with blood, follows like a shadow by a year old cub. A strange game of hide and seek begins. population of polar bears in Hudson Bay, a little farther west, is not so lucky. Here at the new frontier of the Arctic, warming has already claimed victims. The crew finds the remains of a young bear on the shore. He appears to have died of starvation after exhausting his fat reserves. So how old is Well, judging by size, Color, 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 
Hudson Bay, the ice melts earlier every spring and forms later every fall. For the polar bears, who depend on the ice to feed themselves, a longer summer means a longer period without food. Sometimes, the dearth of food becomes unbearable. The cubs, less resilient than the adults, are the first victims of the lack of ice. Twenty years ago, the bay was still completely covered with ice on July 1st. Since then, the ice cover has constantly diminished to the point where it now disappears almost completely at the beginning of summer. Silently, but inexorably, the world we know so little about is changing. The Sedna team is also investigating the impact of the thinning ice cover on walruses. This year, they were unable to hitch a ride on drifting ice blocks to get to their feeding sites, as they usually do in the spring. They were obliged to find refuge on solid ground. Deprived of seals, the polar bears are on the prowl for walruses. Attacks have already been observed. But while they are adept at hunting seals, the bears have a hard time capturing such large prey. They must rely on the fat reserves built up in the spring to get through the summer. The Lord of the Arctic is condemned to wander aimlessly, awaiting the return of the ice. In Hudson Bay, the ice is thinning. And specialists fear that if the warming trend continues, one day all that will remain of this majestic symbol of the Arctic is the memory. The premature melting of the pack ice in spring alters the age-old balance of the world of ice, forcing all Arctic species to adapt. The first law of nature is adapt or die. Here, everyone must adapt to change, including the Inuit, as they have always had to do to survive in these conditions. No, we're picking up. In Hudson Strait, Sedna is suddenly confronted with six meter waves, where there is no longer any ice to stop the wind from shaping the sea. The current seems to take malicious pleasure in whipping up waves. And that wraps it up. So let's go ahead and look back at our learning goal. The students will be able to compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and plants that enable them to survive in different environments.